reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. Paul writes, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This reading from the book of Galatians omits my favorite words from the, chapter, from the book. And those words are, you foolish Galatians. Ouch. You know, Paul could at least usually squeak out a few words of thanksgiving for what one of the new gatherings of Christ followers was accomplishing. Romans. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. 1 Corinthians, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus for in every way you have been enriched by him. 1 Thessalonians, we always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's those foolish Galatians. Paul's first words after his greeting to the Galatians are, I am astonished, astonished at their behavior and not in a good way. And angry? My Lord, yes, he's even mad at Peter. Mad enough to describe blow by blow an argument they had, even repeating the words of his very public condemnation of Peter. Mad enough that you can practically see him throwing up his hands when he cries, you foolish Galatians. Poor old Paul. I wouldn't have Paul's job for anything. A principal organizer of the new community of Christ followers, he was also its fire extinguisher in chief. Seven letters in the New Testament are considered authentically the compositions of Paul, and all seven address some crisis or another among the brothers and sisters in the new community of Christ followers. And these are the letters they saved. Why would you do that? Save a letter written by someone who is angry with you. And why would you let people read it? The biblical canon was shaped over time from the documents most often read in the various gatherings of the early church. If a gospel or epistle made it into the New Testament, you can bet that it was being read in a lot of places. Wouldn't the Galatians be embarrassed to know that you and I and Christians throughout the world would forever hear Paul calling them foolish? Maybe the letter got out of their hands before they had the chance to do damage control. Or maybe they took the letter to heart. Maybe they even cherished it because it was what they needed to hear. And over the centuries, Paul's letter to the Galatians has continued to be what the church throughout the world needs to hear. Commentator Richard B. Hayes says the letter to the Galatians was preserved and cherished in the church because it offers a compelling model for how to think theologically about the challenges faced in the community's life. Now, in Paul's community of Christ followers, the challenges were indeed great because this thing that was happening was new. The Jews who followed Christ were no longer waiting for a Messiah. They acknowledged that Messiah had come, and that was a new way of being Jewish. Meanwhile, the Gentiles who were following Christ might previously have followed all kinds of spiritual paths, from synagogue worship to pagan cult ceremonies. 
And for them, following Christ was a whole new way of being religious. And then these Jewish and Gentile Christ followers had to form community together. That was certainly new, and it raised an essential question. What marked people as community members? How did you know if you were in or out? Where were the borders of this new country? Because in Judaism, the borders were clearly marked. The Mosaic law was a boundary drawn around the Jewish community, marking them as holy and set apart. If you didn't follow the law, you were not a Jew. That was a clear boundary. Until the community of Christ-following Jews began absorbing Christ-following Gentiles. That raised crucial questions. Did a Gentile who wanted to follow Christ first have to become a Jew? Did a Gentile Christ follower have to follow Mosaic law? For that matter, did a Jew? If circumcision was no longer a boundary and dietary laws were no longer a boundary, where were the boundaries? These were not small matters, and they were not pursued by small people. These were the matters in that argument between Peter and Paul who were hardly minor figures in the church. And the dispute had been generated, apparently, not by people who sought to stop Jews from following Christ, but by Jewish Christ followers who were absolutely earnest and faithful in what they believed and preached. It was their understanding that, yes, you did have to follow the Jewish law in order to follow Christ. And apparently a lot of the Galatians were seeing it their way, and that's why Paul was so upset. Because Paul believed and preached that Christ's death had liberated the world from the boundaries set down by the law. Christ's death had changed the world by changing the relationship between humanity and God. Before Christ's death, Paul says in this letter, humanity needed the law to keep them disciplined. The law was not just a boundary but a fence keeping unruly humans contained, safe from their own bad instincts. But now humanity can live freely in a new country whose borders outlined the risen body of Christ. What is life like in this new country? Well, there are a lot of prepositions involved. If you don't remember what a preposition is, Let me dredge up the memory of my ninth grade English teacher, Mrs. Hudson. Here's how she explained prepositions. She held up one fist. And she told us that prepositions express relationships in time or space. And then she made her fist the object of the prepositions, which she acted out with the other hand. Before the fist, behind the fist, above the fist, with the fist, into the fist. When I think of prepositions, and I do think of prepositions because once an English major, always an English major, when I think of prepositions, I always see two hands, one in motion, the other steady and still, and the two always in relationship. Now for Paul, Christ is like the fist, the object of the prepositions. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You are one in Christ Jesus. You belong to Christ. Baptized into, clothed with, one in belonging to. In this changing community, the Galatians are in motion, but at every turn they remain in relationship with Christ. And within that relationship, there are no boundaries marking one group as different from another. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. Galatians without borders. It's a shocking idea. But today we often forget to be shocked by Paul. We've heard his letters read so many times that we forget he was giving his life for a new thing, 
a religious group that crossed the boundaries between Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, that was new. But we forget to be shocked by Galatians without borders because we think all those problems of boundaries and exclusion and inclusion were solved long ago. So let me just pause and ask, does anybody here ever read the letters to the editor of our local paper? It doesn't take much reading to recognize that we have not stopped trying to set up boundaries within the unboundaried body of Christ. Day after day, letter writers try to mark off the territory of true Christianity. And just as in Galatia, the people who would set up boundaries are preaching what they earnestly believe to be best for the church, best for the world, and most closely in line with the will of God. And yet somehow, everyone wants to set the boundaries in a different place. Who writes these harsh, argumentative, sometimes downright hostile letters? Not bad people, but sometimes angry people, and often frightened people. All of us at one time or another have found ourselves among them, and the Apostle Paul was among them. He was angry to see the rebuilding of walls that Christ had torn down. He was even afraid that the saving work of Christ might somehow come to nothing. And to prevent that catastrophe, he was willing to scold and willing to shock. Later in the letter to Galatians, he would make his point by doing shocking things with the scriptures boldly reinterpreting the fundamental narrative of Jewish identity in order to cast the Gentiles as children of Abraham and inheritors of the promise, Galatians without borders. Anger and fear will always accompany challenging times in the life of the community. And life in Christian community is continuously challenging. Discussing the controversy in Galatians, Richard Hayes says that God's redemptive work necessarily includes the reshaping of the community's life together. That reshaping was not completed in Paul's day. The life of the community must be continually reshaped because God's continuing redemptive work is always doing a new thing. This means that in the country whose borders are the outline of the body of Christ, we may not always dwell in comfort. How could we when things are continually changing and continually being reshaped? And worst of all, there are no boundaries within that body to keep us separated from ideas and people who make us uncomfortable. We wonder where we stand and where others stand in this new kind of community. What marks us as members of the community? How do we know who's in and who's out? We know by the waters of baptism flowing over us, for we are baptized into Christ. We know by the rustle and drape and feel of the sacred garment we wear, for we are clothed with Christ. We know by an embrace that makes physical and real our oneness in Christ. And so we find our comfort renewed in the understanding that we belong to Christ. Maybe the Galatians saved that letter, even cherished the letter, even shared the letter because despite Paul's obvious anger, he also wrote these words of comfort and reassurance, baptized into, clothed with, one in, belonging to, those comforting prepositions, those unending relationships. Richard Hayes says Galatians offers a model for thinking theologically about the challenges in our community life. If that's too complicated, let's just think grammatically. Remember the prepositions. Baptized into, clothed with, one in, belonging to. We are always in relationship to Christ even when in motion. And the Christian community will always be in motion 
because Christ's death has dismantled the boundaries that could have kept us stuck in place. And so we strive not to be foolish Galatians. We are set free to live as Galatians without borders, Christians without borders, Moravians without borders. We live and move freely in ever new community within the unboundaried country that is the body of Christ. Amen. <laughs>